I'm, uh, uh, my name is Simon Shafetz. I was uh, Morris College 2012, and uh, I uh, am involved here with Yale Tech. Um, the, uh, I'm actually really uh, excited for the next talk. Uh, I've, it's very in keeping with the theme of changing the face of tech, uh, and, and this time from the angle of impact. And I'm very glad that the end of the last talk uh, touched on uh, you know, the huge appeal of technology to impact people's lives on a massive scale. And I think uh, uh, that's been the draw of tech since the beginning, uh, and you know, maybe even uh, good old Mr. Morse code uh, you know, was excited about the idea of like impacting communications um, around the world when he invented that. But there, there's also been this uh, uh, realization over, I don't know, maybe a decade, 20 years, uh, that in spite of uh, increased productivity, thanks to technology, uh, you know, we haven't seen the, uh, the benefits of that productivity uh, uh, impact everyone's lives the way people originally thought it would. Uh, and in fact, we see, you know, rising inequality. Um, and, and so uh, investors and entrepreneurs uh, are increasingly interested in uh, applications of technologies that impact everyone's lives for the better. And so, you know, there was the example of medicine that came up. Um, that's a really exciting one. Education technology is really big. Um, and then there's also another area called civic tech, uh, which is you know, putting service, uh, technology to the service of um, governance. And uh, the two next speakers are maybe some of the most qualified people in the US to talk about that. So uh, I'm really excited to hear them uh, have a conversation about civic tech. Um, the interviewer is going to be Miles Lassiter, who is very well known, actually, uh, for his uh, uh, ventures in education technology. He uh, was the uh, founder uh, of a company called Hire One, which he took public. Um, uh, and that, you know, that one had all sorts of recognition for being a very fast growing company. Uh, now he uh, uh, has another company, Hire One Education Network. Sorry, that's not the right name. Another education company. One year is the network, thank you. Um, but uh, he also sits on the board of another company he founded called C Click Fix, which was a very uh, visionary company uh, when it was founded because it was taking uh, crowdsourcing and local uh, mobile technology and putting it to the service of city governances and public infrastructure. Um, and he still sits on the board of C Click Fix. He's going to be interviewing uh, Jen Palak, who is uh, the founder and executive director of um, Code for America, which. Uh, is a fellowship program specifically uh, focused on civic tech and improving cities uh, through through technology. Um, before that, she was a deputy CTO uh, at the uh, uh, White House Office for Science and Technology Policy, um, and uh, she is also, uh, aside from her remarkable, remarkable career, internet famous for a very successful TED Talk uh, called Coding a Better Government, uh, which you should definitely take a look at if, if you're not already familiar. Um, so, with that, uh, please welcome Miles and Jen. Thank you for having us. Um, so, we heard a little bit in the introduction about Code for America, and maybe that's a place to start. Mm -hmm. um, tell us more about the organization, no, known uh, for the fellowship, but also the other programs. It would be great to hear about. Uh, yes, yeah, so, has anyone here heard of Code for America before? And don't raise your hand, Jessica. He's <laughs> one of our fellows. <laughs> Excellent, good. Well, for the rest of you, um, we used to call ourselves the Peace Corps for Geeks. Um, do you object to that? Because I know Jessica Cole here uh, is not, not really a geek, but she is definitely helping uh, the city that she's working with, Kansas City. So instead of uh, getting people to go to uh, the developing world, um, we get people with technical and design and other uh, sort of tech industry skills to go work with city governments because uh, they need some help often. Uh, uh, Jessica, for example, is working with the city of Kansas City, and um, they have a lot of problems with uh, the immunization records for kids in their school, causing a lot of problems for a lot of people, particularly in when school's starting. And she's only been there with them for a couple months and already sort of helping sort out how to not have everybody, all of the parents waiting in line right before the beginning of the school year to get their kids shots, to get their uh, immunization records, uh, and actually to make sure that we do know that kids in school are immunized, which is sort of the, prob the real problem at the end of the day is we sort of don't know this. Um, so that's one example of what we're doing. Um, 
We've been doing this since 2011. Uh, I've had five classes, uh, uh, Jessica's class is the sixth class of Code for America Fellows. Um, and because we've been doing it for a long time, working with about 100 different cities, uh, some of our projects now, uh, as Miles was mentioning, are, uh, are sort of living on past the year that the fellows work with the cities on them. And I can talk a little bit more about those, but they're, we're, we're really deepening our work, particularly in social services. Um, this may surprise you, but uh, do you have anybody here have any idea how much the government spends on the social safety net a year? It's about $470 billion dollars. Uh, if you take all of the money that uh, Americans donate to charities, it's about $42 billion. So for every dollar of charitable money, we are spending 11 government dollars. And we're not getting the outcomes that we should for that. So we've increasingly been working on projects um, like A Better Way to Get on Food Stamps here in San Francisco that uh, the fellows started in 2013, but now we're continuing on and um, spreading to more and more California counties and hopefully the rest of the country soon. So what do you think are the barriers for governments to do these projects without a Code for America? Or why aren't they more successful with these dollars today? Well, governments have a lot of constraints in how they work. Um, and uh, probably most people in the room could sort of point to some of them. Um, at see Click Fix, I think um, your team became very familiar with government procurement uh, and had some good hacks around it, as many of the startups now have figured out. See Click Fix was really one of the first. Um, procurement is one. Um, I think really the, the biggest thing, though, is that government uh, workers have often felt very uh, risk averse. And I think one of the things I always like to tell people is that the risk aversion of government is not really something we should blame on public workers. Uh, the people who create that risk aversion um, are the public, because we're very, very critical of government, and we tend to box them into a corner. If you are afraid of a negative story, um, you are going to make sure everything is compliant uh, and checks all the boxes and maybe not be able to sort of get around those constraints that uh, put you in a position to actually be able to get the outcome that you were intending to do. So what we're really doing is sort of helping them think about the needs of the user, how to get to the outcome, and deal with all of the compliance issues along the way, but put those second to user needs. And how do you think about or measure the impact that you've had at Code for America? Uh, so we've been measuring the impact in a lot of ways. Um, one of the big things is just the talent pipeline, particularly of tech and design professionals into government. Um, uh, about 55 uh, people so far have come through our program and then ended up in great positions, um, particularly chief data officer positions. This is something that didn't really exist until 2011 or so. Um, you might have known that your city had a chief information officer or a chief communications officer. Um, but starting, uh, you know, in, uh, uh, with the open data movement, um, we actually started seeing cities create chief data officer positions, and several of them are held by former Code for America fellows. They're also in positions like um, chief performance officer, chief innovation officer, analysts, um, digital services groups that are modeled after what we did in federal government. Um, so talent is a, is a really big one. Um, we're also looking at just the apps that go into government, whether they're sustained. Um, and we're looking at the number of people around the country who uh, do this outside of the fellowship. So Jessica, for example, was able to um, take a year off and come to us for the whole year. And she's back and forth between uh, San Francisco and Kansas City. Uh, but we've got people in communities who want to do this kind of work, who want to help their community and their local government uh, doing apps and data and other kinds of tech and oftentimes just design interventions. Um, and they're doing that, um, you know, Tuesday nights in uh, City Hall, for instance. Actually, it's, uh, it's Tuesday nights in Oakland and Wednesday nights at Code for America here in San Francisco. There's about 50,000 people around the country who uh, volunteer on this basis, and those are called our Code for America brigades. So we're also measuring that, uh, the growth of that network and the impacts of that network. Yeah, I think that's an incredible number of people who are engaging in a, in a way that didn't really exist before in helping uh, governments be more effective rather than you know, signing a petition or mm -hmm. you know, uh, something else to shake the government uh, into performing better, actually 
volunteering in that way, and particularly around these kind of design, tech, innovation areas, I think is fascinating. You alluded a little bit to your um, digital service work that you did mm -hmm. personally um, and the federal government. Uh, maybe you could tell people more about that as well. Sure. So um, I started Code for America in 2010, and we had our first class of fellows in 2011, so we were a couple of years into it. Um, when I was approached just at the end of the first Obama administration um, about a program that would, had been started, really modeled after Code for America, but within federal agencies. Um, the guy who approached me is a guy named Todd Park, uh, who was at the time the uh, Chief Technology Officer of the United States. Um, by that the way, is an amazing title, by the way. It's a great title. Um, yeah, and, and you know, we never had them before. So uh, prior to the Obama administration, there were CIOs and sometimes CTOs in, um, in the agencies, but there was no overarching CTO or CIO, and so Obama put If in. I had that title, I'd be um, inclined to introduce myself as the CTO. The CTO. <laughs> Period. It's just so Drop much mic. fun. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, yeah. I was the deputy. I was one of two, so you can't even do that. Yeah, it doesn't work quite the same. Uh, anyway, so Todd, Todd was the second person to hold that seat, and one of the things he did was create a program called the Presidential Innovation Fellows, much like Code for America Fellows, and he asked me to um, come help run it, um, and I um, actually didn't want to do that. I, I love the Presidential Innovation Fellows, and I did end up working really closely with them, uh, but I really wanted, I, I figured, um, though I didn't want that job and didn't want to move to D.C., I did want to advocate for something that I had seen. Um, in fact, it, it was actually where I was when he called me. I was at the government digital service in the U.K., where instead of having sort of innovation teams trying to create open data programs and um, spur innovation, they actually sort of centralized the authority for all digital spend uh, in one place in the cabinet office. And uh, it's as if you took all the federal agencies and said, nope, you're all doing this this way. They hired a guy who was the former head of digital for the Guardians who came from the consumer tech industry. Uh, and they've been completely transforming digital services for British citizens or you know, the, the public. Um, in a way that really looks a lot more like a consumer app, much simpler, easier to use, uh, actually costs a lot less to have these better systems. And I had never seen anybody do it on such a scale and so well, and I was so impressed with it. I said, Todd, you really need to have uh, a, a version of this in the U.S. that you know, sits in a central place of authority. It can really start to change how we do tech in uh, in the United States. And so, uh, long story in there where I did finally agree to go. I Traveling across the country every week is a little bit tough. Like, if many of you have probably lived in two places at once. My, many of my friends say, I'm just waiting for the year I have a one hair dryer life. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we uh, managed to do all of that and um, got to DC. And um, I guess the short version of the story is I don't think anything would have really happened with my grand plan. Um, that people thought was a nice idea, but wasn't a really high priority until October 1st, 2013, um, which was both the day that we shut down the government and the day that healthcare.gov launched. Didn't go so well, and suddenly there was a much greater understanding that, in fact, um, uh, if we can't put up a website that works, we can't govern. We can't actually implement the laws that we have spent like, you know, many years and all of our political capital to... Um, uh, to pass, and uh, then there was uh, a lot more uh, energy and enthusiasm for uh, what we had proposed, which was the United States Digital Service. Um, we finally got that stood up just as I was returning back to Code for America. I had a year leave of absence, uh, but it's now a very successful, exciting uh, unit within the White House um, that works with the agencies that need it most to get their tech right. So Department of Ed particularly, um, the Veterans Administration um, still works with uh, uh, Health and Human Services on healthcare.gov, a number of other uh, real key priorities. Um, and we were able to build a um, complementary organization within the General Services Administration um, that does very much the same work but on a little bit of a different basis. So they kind of work very closely together, a unit called 18F and the United States Digital Service. And uh, if you've um, 
seen, for instance, the new tools that came out for vets.gov. It looks different. It works. <laughs> Veterans can sign up for healthcare. This stuff, it's actually starting to work because we've got the best people on these um, on these really difficult challenges, and they're breaking down the barriers within the organization to just get it done and have things work for people who need them. So we're among friends, right? It's the Yale Network. You can tell us the secret. How do you get cheaper, better, faster technology projects done in a government environment like that? It would be hard to do government technology projects for more expensive than they are. <laughs> <laughs> Part of it is that the bar is kind of low. Um, <laughs> the, the bar for cost is, is well, low or high, depending on what you're talking about. The, these things are, are insanely expensive. Nobody knows how much healthcare.gov cost, but it was um, certainly um, upwards towards a billion dollars, all told. Um, the Veterans Administration spends just massive amounts. Um, I'll talk a little bit about a project that we just worked with the state of California on that was going to be starting at $600 million. Um, the online form that you use today if you're trying to apply for food stamps in California, which is 50 screens long and asks a couple hundred questions just to apply for food benefits. Um, It's unusable, and almost no one who starts it ever gets through it, but taxpayers here are paying $80 million a year just to maintain it. It's not even being built. It's just the maintenance contract is $80 million a year. So um, pretty easy to do better than that. Um, uh, if your question, um, sorry, I kind of took that in a different direction because I know what you really meant, which is how do you get it done? Yeah, I was being kind of flipped, yeah. but you were talking about breaking down barriers and putting yeah. in new talent, and is that all it is, and what are those barriers? Yeah. And I think the thing that um, Code for America fellows have shown me over and over again, and Presidential Innovation fellows, and folks who work at 18F, is um, there's a number one thing that crosses all of these units, all of these groups, all of these um, uh, volunteer groups, but everybody in the civic tech space, and it's start with users. So you've got to stop thinking about your 50-page use, you know, requirements, actually sometimes 5,000-page requirements documents, and start th- thinking about the person that you're trying to serve and what's the critical minimal thing that you can provide them that will actually work. Um, and talking about users and demonstrating what users go through is kryptonite, especially at places like the VA. Um, we're, you know, the, we've just got a big win over there um, the other day, and, part, and it was a, a form for applying for healthcare that literally just hasn't worked for something like 10 years. Um, and the team went out and found a homeless veteran and had a, a camera and a, a, an audio and, and a screen, you know, screen share thing and just documented this veteran trying to sign up for healthcare every step of the way and then showed it in a staff meeting. And it's like, you know, when you can demonstrate, no, it really just doesn't work, there, and then demonstrate that we have another solution, you can get the, the solution turned on and the old one turned off, but it can be very difficult. Um, the other thing is um, government's really used to planning. We do a lot of planning in government, and um, what fellows will do is instead of planning, they'll just build a prototype. And sometimes it doesn't even work. Sometimes it's like it's slideware. In other words, it looks like it's an app, but it doesn't have any functionality yet. But the minute people see that there's something that could be better, that could actually get the job done, and then you know we can say, well, we'll have the you know the minimum viable product of it up in a couple weeks. It just completely changes the conversation from what are the barriers to how can we just get how can we get that? Can we get that? You know, when can you have it? And um, sure, those barriers come back but you're just having a different conversation. What was it like to leave an organization that you created to go on your own fellowship year? Um, Well, it it turned out to be certainly the most interesting year of my life, and I'm very glad I did it. Um, And I um, I really ended up doing it because here I was encouraging people to go do public service, and I'd never worked in government. I felt like a bit of a hypocrite. Um, It was hard to leave the org, though, and I think... um, uh, I wouldn't recommend to any entrepreneurs to go, you know, a couple years into building your organization, leave for a year, and come back, um, and under ideal circumstances. But um, I'm, I'm certainly glad I did it. Um, I certainly feel like while um, Code for America took a little bit of a pause while I was gone, the whole network of people doing this work grew so much, uh, and we're so well tied to them right now that it's it's. Um, 
it, it, in the end, we will do better work because of it. And, and let, actually, let me give you an, ex, an example of how um, working in federal government helps Code for America do a better job in the long run. Um, and it's another one of those horror stories I know people t tend to like. Um, at the end of last year, the state of California asked us to help them with a procurement that they were doing for the child welfare system. Um, the software that social workers and others use uh, to deal with the 475,000 reports of abuse and neglect of kids in California today has been out of federal compliance for a long time. And the state's been trying to put together a new RFP to, um, to build a new system. And it, 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 this has been a very, an ongoing uh, chronic problem for the state. Uh, it's a very big problem for social workers who just essentially have no working software. Um, we looked at their RFP, and it was all the hallmarks of a failed IT project. Um, IT projects in government have about a 94% failure rate anyway, and this was even worse than average. So we said, it's not going to work. Uh, and you're, what, it's, what's worse than blowing the $600 million that you're going to blow is that six years from now, you, won't ha you still won't have anything that works, and you're going to be starting over. And that six years is a lot of reports of abuse and neglect that will not be handled as well as they could. Um, so they took our recommendations, and they said they agreed. But uh, then a couple months later, they said, well, we don't have any other options, so we are going to go forward with this. And I, my first job out here in California, I worked in child welfare, and I became a little bit crazy uh, about that decision and, and made some phone calls. And it, it turns out that the, the guy who oversees um, the, uh, the money that comes from the feds to the states to build this system was somebody that I had worked with at the White House and could make a phone call to. And, and it sounds like terrible nepotism, but uh, it's all you know above board. Um, and we were able to, and called people at the state that I knew would care about this, um, and we were able to help them rewrite that RFP in an agile, modular way, um, using open source and open standards. And um, we, you know, it, it actually went out as a completely different RFP based on user needs. Um, and we wouldn't have been able to do that. I, I, I would have, I think, been stuck in the insanely frustrated place if we hadn't been able to connect the dots between what happens at the county level, the state level, and all the way up to the federal level. So you're talking about a case where software impacts the lives of children, families. Mm -hmm. Is that part of what got you into um, civic tech originally? I mean, to take your personal story back a little bit further. You know, I don't think um, that I had as much of a realization of how much government technology impacts real people until I got into it. Um, I was working in the tech industry. We got into looking at how at government. Uh, and it was the contrast between the sort of Web 2.0 world and the government world was really what kind of freaked me out. Um, but I, we were looking at projects that were at DOD, and they seemed a little bit abstract. It's really when I got into the work um, and learned all these things that I realized, and, and, and frankly, the methodology that the Code for America fellows have practiced, and I won't take credit for it, I mean, they, the people who came to the org really brought this, of, um, of really good user research. Um, when you do really good user research, you find out that this stuff doesn't work and the, the impacts of it are just devastating on regular people. Um, so we work a lot on, on SNAP, that's the national program, Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program here in California. It's called CalFresh. I had no idea that half of all Americans will use SNAP at some point in their lives, that most kids will, that you know, when, when you cannot sign up for SNAP, which is what California, by the way, I assume most of us here in California, has the second lowest enrollment rate in SNAP of any state in the country because our co the way you sign up is so complex and then the way you finish signing up is even worse. Um, you know, if, if there are millions of Californians that could be getting food assistance and, that aren't. So it was really getting into this space and learning more that made me realize this isn't just about saving money. I, I care less now about the waste in, in government. I care about the fact that, um, as Ezra Klein said, you know, healthcare.gov was on the front pages. But if you're using government 
programs, you're experiencing something as bad or worse than healthcare.gov every day right now, even after healthcare.gov. We, man- we monitor the uptime of SNAP sites around this country. And it's like, it was big, big news that healthcare.gov was down, like, you know, and initially it was 60% of the time, and then it got less and less and less. But tons of sites that are where you would sign up for food stamps, for instance, go down every night, all night, on schedule. They keep banking hours. It's a website that goes down at five. That's to rest. Is to rest, <laughs> sure. Uh, well, yeah, so you have to sign up between those hours. I mean, um, there's some that have just been down for several months and no one knows when they're going to come back up. There's some that just have very low uptime. There's some that, but all of them, whether they're up or not, are really, really hard to use. And um, it just shouldn't be this way for the amount of money that we're spending. Again, and that $470 billion should buy us a decent app that works. You're here. <laughs> I couldn't agree more. Uh, Do you want me to get off my soapbox? <laughs> Well, if I could turn the, the conversation still a little bit more in a personal direction, again, given that it's a Yale event, would love to hear any thoughts you have on how Yale education or network has helped you uh, in your career. Um, I mean, I think here in San Francisco, you know, I've been, I kind of came out here, worked in social services, um, and then ended up in tech media, and then I was like the non-technical person in tech or I mean, many of us are, but um, uh, I think I've really valued, um, ha- I mean, I was an American Studies major. Any other Amstead majors in the room? Yeah. Okay, so we're a small minority. Oh, hello. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> uh, I always joke that, like, what do you do with an American Studies major? You found an organization called Code for America. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but I, I really have valued the, um, the sort of breadth of, of my Yale education, um, and I feel like the tech you can, you know, you can. I know there's many uh, uh, computer science grads in this. I'm not trying to put that down, but like um, I've, I've valued having the breadth of the Yale education, and I know everybody, no matter what you um, what your major was, um, just got that um, that sort of curiosity uh, about learning and sort of the variety of perspectives. Um, and certainly the network has, um, has helped. I was joking with, with Jessica that, um, once again, on the nepotism theme, I'm, I'm the, probably the third person to hold the title deputy CTO, again, because it was a new office, and the first person was Andrew McLaughlin, who's not only my year at Yale, but my, but my college. So he did not get me the job. <laughs> Didn't. wasn't nepotism. Uh, but there uh, you know, there, there have been many, uh, there have been many Yaleys uh, in, uh, who've, you know, I think, signed up for the cause of civic tech. Right. Well, um, at this point, if you're okay, I'd love to open up for sure. questions from, from anyone else. All right, cool. Questions. I can stand up. Say your name. Hi, my name's Ashley. Um, this is a little bit less of a question, more just a comment, because... Um, their organization has really affected Long Beach, uh, which is where uh, my business is. So we're a uh, Bloomberg Grant City. Yep. At the same time that we have Dan, you, I assume, I don't know if you know each of the fellows, but he's been there and he has one colleague. Um, so we had the, Bloom, the Bloomberg Grant come in, which infused some capital to think about technology innovation in the city of Long Beach. Uh, we had Code for America get really serious, put two fellows in town. And then um, last year, uh, my company moved offices downtown and then opened up our office space on Saturdays. So the Code for America folks and their recruits, the Bloomberg folks, and then some of our engineers kind of teaching each other's craft skills. And then that spawned two or three other movements of civic hack- hacks within the city. So one was focused on the port, one was focused on fisheries. And so it's just interesting to see that all of that happened very rapidly, you know, within about a year and a half. And it's also a really cool model of how kind of government grant funding, private, private money, private companies, and just interested individuals, you know, once something started like that, how they can really get going. Um, so if there's a question in this, really, I just wanted to say it's working. So okay. thank you for that. <laughs> and if there's a question, it's, you know, if this is the sort of synergy that you're kind of running toward, um, do you have any vision for kind of next steps? I mean, what happens once there's projects like this going on all over the place as far as sharing that intelligence, uh, expanding that network, um, kind of what's, what's next? Well, thank you for that setup. I'll give you your $20 later for... Uh, 
I'm very glad that uh, you're connected with the team. We love working with the Bloomberg I teams. So they do sort of business process rate engineering, and then we can sort of close the loop on actually having tech that um, that puts that in place. Um, um, I, I also think your, your story is perfect because it sort of speaks to the twin challenges slash opportunities of our work, which is the job is so enormous, we can never uh, hope to take it on all ourselves. So we spend a fair amount of our resources and energy just trying to uh, create, you know, uh, help um, spur that civic tech ecosystem and ho- encourage others to be doing this. Uh, we spend a fair amount of time and energy and money um, early on actually running accelerators and incubators for civic startups. Um, and then when that seemed to sort of be a thing of its own and there became more venture capital available to civic startups, actually I would give, again, C Click Fix a fair amount of credit for seeding that. We started when, gosh, C Click Fix is what, 2010? Uh, we've, I was actually just looking at the blog post today. Uh, we started working in 2007. 2007, okay. Way, they the guys were yeah. way early and, and way great because even when we started in 2010, there was still a lot of like, hmm, I don't want to put money into a company that's going to work with government because they'll never get paid. Um, so anyway, uh, that's really changed a lot. There's a lot more civic startups now and uh, a lot more people doing it in, in a variety of ways, whether it's entrepreneurial or volunteer um, or starting new groups like ours. Uh, um, so we, we've got to just figure out how more and more people go to do this because, uh, the, the, again, the problem is so big. And then in the work that we do with the apps um, and the relationships with government, uh, our, our future direction really is around things that can scale. Um, we had hoped to find more scale within cities, um, and we're really finding that uh, – Scaling through programs that are um, administered locally but um, funded nationally have something in common because of that national funding and have impact at scale. I mean, uh, SNAP is is basically been proven to be the most effective way to pull people out of poverty, or at least to keep them falling below the poverty line. Um, uh, it, we think we can we can really tackle programs like that at scale and then tackle the ones that are adjacent to them. So that's sort of our future. Cool. Question from Jessica over here. Hi, Jessica. Hi. Hi, Jen. Thanks. Um, so from the nonprofit sector, you've been able to make these really meaningful interventions in the public sector. But as you all may have noticed, it's an election year. So as we all go out to vote, what do you think we can and should expect and demand of our public servants when it comes to technical intelligence at this point? Oh, again, thank you. I'll give you your $20. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I'm not a fan. I think... I think um, a lot of people have talked about expecting our um, leaders and public servants to be more technical. That would be great, but basically when we say that, it just scares people. Um, people who are non-technical are constantly insecure about it, including me. So I think it's really more about um, demanding that, that public services work and that we put technology in the role that it needs to be in in order to get there. Um, One of the things I'm constantly sort of not surprised by but um, dismayed by is that we have such low expectations for public services. Um, We're, like, completely delighted and surprised when, you know, there are some DMVs that are doing a great job right now. Has anyone been to these, like, fantastic DMVs? I think there's one. No, I'm not kidding. There really are a couple. (laughs) Everyone's looking at me like she's making a joke. No, somebody, really? I think there's one on the peninsula that... um, no? Yes? Okay. Anyway, the, when, you, when you have these experiences, and there, and there are some... Um, with, that guy over there raised his hand for $20. Okay. <laughs> oh, God. I only have 60 so <laughs> no more payoffs. Um, but wait, have you really been to... It's San Mateo. That's what I thought. So, yeah, everyone go to the San Mateo DMV. Apparently, it's fantastic. Um, no, but, but when you do encounter an experience like that, you're just completely surprised. And... Um, that's part of the problem is that we sort of accept these this, this very, very poor interfaces um, when it just could be so much better. I used to, I, I was not, never going to do this because I want to be very respectful of government as well, but um, think like, uh, take the, your favorite app that you use and then redesign it as a government app. <laughs> 
Uh, I'm a Lyft fan, for instance. So, like, what would Lyft look like? It would be, like, a form that you would fill out with, like, a bunch of things, and then you would get a call later saying that maybe you were going to get a car. Um, I think a lot, a lot of form validation errors on your address saying yes. that it wasn't formatted according to USPS standards. Yeah. Yeah, a bunch so. of drop-down menus where you couldn't read the menu items. There's a lot of that. Um, so Your application has been referred for uh, further review. Yes. Like, please, please call between... Yeah. Um, so anyway, Jessica, to answer your question, what I think, what, what, what I would most like um, uh, people to hold their public servants accountable to is just the, there isn't any inherent natural reason why public serv- digital services from government aren't as good as what you're using at home. There are a couple constraints. I get it. There's going to be always a couple questions, a little bit more legalese than we want. Um, but we, we should think of them as, as better than we, far better than we do. We should think of them as causing, uh, costing orders of magnitude less. Um, and we should um, really expect the public officials and government uh, officials who are monitoring these programs to have real-time data about whether they are working. I care very much about the user experience, but I also care about the programs that we put billions and billions of dollars in having real-time data that will allow us to know when we need to change to get the outcomes uh, that we're looking for. Yeah, and just to, uh, just to build on that, uh, you can also just vote. I mean, some, some cities have, I, I'm from LA, and, and our mayor in LA, two years ago when he was running, he kind of courted the tech vote, because the whole tech thing was starting to pop there, and he won. One of the first things he did was he ha- hired a, one division to create an app, uh, a division of government to create an app, where you could actually go around and take potholes in LA, and there are a lot, uh, and basically have real time, like, acknowledgement of where the pothole is, and then someone would go and fix it. In a much shorter time, I think uh, and then he's also doing C-click he's fix. also doing things it like be. it, it is it's it's C-click fix white label. Yeah, there we go. Yeah. He's also doing things like uh, city hackathons, where um, he invites like the tech community in and yeah. basically hack ideas for tri- fixing transportation, fixing other things. Uh, and they also has actually demanded each of his twenty three services to get more tech and to revamp their websites. And some of them are supposed to get apps. And so it kind of can depend on the city official and basically vote for the ones who are more tech and then they will be. All right, so speaking of Lyft, we have a question from Simon from Uber. <laughs> Sorry, Simon. Uh, yeah, so it's a competitor. You can also get a ride. Um, <laughs> I have heard of it. Oh, sweet. Um, yeah, this is a... Donna did say we were well served with rides. So <laughs> I'm glad to hear it. Uh, I, I hope so. Um, so I, uh, a conversation that I try to follow, but sort of from a distance, uh, I'm, I don't think I'm in a great position to like, uh, form a, a solid opinion on it. Um, and so I'd love to hear your thoughts on it, is the question of uh, coding and technical education uh, across the country. Uh, if you're in Silicon Valley, and, uh, and I include San Francisco, you know, it, it seems like coding is everything. And so, like, obviously, yeah, like, learn to code and your life will be the better for it, even if you don't necessarily want to be a developer. But that's because whether you're working in tech or, like, adjacent, like, it's probably in your, around you. Um, but I wonder, is that actually, like, high-hanging fruit when we're thinking of uh, making a strong economic impact on communities that are currently underprivileged? Um, where like maybe even literacy is uh, not you know coding literacy, but actual literacy is uh, is still a concern. Um, is is there is there hype? Should should we believe the hype? Uh, are have you are you aware of programs that seem like they're doing the right things, or what, what are things that are that are, we're doing that are wrong um, in the whole conversation and process for uh, expanding coding education? Well, I'll invite my interviewer to answer that as well. I mean, we do see a fair number of programs. In fact, a lot of people confuse us for a program that teaches kids to code or underprivileged groups to code. We don't do that, though. That does happen occasionally through the fellowship. We do a lot of community events. And I think, actually, the the underserved community that we have most taught tech skills to is mayors. Um, (laughs) Done a lot of, like, showing mayors how to use um, Google Docs and things like that. We haven't taught a mayor to code yet. Um, but, um, I mean, I, I don't think I have any special expertise to say, you know, or, or special perspective to inform this opinion. But, yes, I do believe that, um, you know, equal access to tech industry jobs and to the ability to do tech um, 
is, is really critical for equality in our society. Um, and I do think that the, what I, again, what I've learned from Code for America fellows is the ability to sort of prototype something is magic. And if you can do that in your own life, um, it may not even necessarily be about getting a job, but it's hugely, hugely empowering. I, I don't have any answers in terms of what works and what doesn't work, but maybe Miles does. Yeah, I think your question was largely around economic development. How do we, how do we spark that? And uh, I'm not sure I'm an expert on that, but I think startups are pretty cool. <laughs> are there programs for uh, Latino or urban uh, as neighborhoods to have tech programs or hackathons or things like that? Are there is that happening? So th there are a ton of those. Um, uh, um, and but but great... I don't know if those spark economic development necessarily, like directly. It's a uh, yeah. second order effects, maybe. Yeah. Uh, right nearby here, by the way, is a great organization everyone should support called Code 2040. Does everyone has anyone heard of this? So um, Code 2040 uh, is based on the idea that by the year 2040, the tech industry should be representative of the population of the United States um, in gender, race, and ethnicity. Um, lovely woman who runs that named Laura Whiteman Powers. Um, there's organizations like Yes We Code. There's um, in Oakland where I live. Um, there's Hack the Hood, which is a fantastic organization. Um, I think, as a, an observation, somewhat self-serving in terms of reinforcing that point about the size of government relative to the size of philanthropy. Most of these programs are small. They are serving. They start out serving ten kids. They end up serving a couple hundred kids. The amount of money that goes through them is in the couple of millions. Um, I, I can't remember the exact number off the top of my head, but like workforce, federal workforce training dollars, I think is $14 billion. So the federal workforce training dollars could be applied to giving people the kinds of skills that will actually get them a job, but they're not. And that's actually one of the program, problems that we're working on in the fellowship this year, um, partnered with the city of New Orleans, that gets a disproportionate number of uh, workforce training dollars, and yet 52% of African American men of working age are not working. This is a failure of the system. So I, I, I used it a little bit to get back on my soapbox, apologies. But um, we should be supporting those programs, uh, that, like Hack the Hood and Code 2040, but we also just need to make the giant buckets of money we spend on these problems work. Uh, Jeff, I agree. Um, uh, I think we have some question over here. Oh, uh, can we do Jeff first? And then, oh, uh, sorry, I didn't I see said, it. Yeah, Jeff was raised his hand before. Jeff, can you stand up so you can be on camera? <laughs> I'm from LA. If you've got to be on camera, go ahead and stand up. <laughs> so, so you can uh, get so the Jeff back of my head. Uh, UI Wizards. Uh, he knows something probably about coding back end design uh, and front end. So, anyway. Um, so you were saying that uh, we should have high expectations of government software, just as high expectations as we have of you know apps that we buy in the store. Yep. Um, but it seems to me, and maybe you can address this, that government apps and government websites have to satisfy constraints that uh, you know private industry can say, well, we'll get around to Section 508 on release two. Mm -hmm. And the government website has to satisfy it on release one on the first day, right? So there are going to be constraints that are going to make it much harder to get that thing. You can't roll it out in version three or four or five. You have to roll it out right away. So um, I, I just want to yeah. get your point on that. No, it's a great point. So um, 508 is um, accessibility compliance. Um, yeah, so there's, there's a lot of constraints. So, for instance, yes, you could, in the private sector, roll out an app that um, was, uh, uh, didn't comply with a bunch of standards that help people who have limited vision or other ways um, use the app. And in government, you do. I think one of the things that we've um, introduced in government, not single-handedly, but I think we played a big role in, is just the idea of an alpha. And so um, your alpha does not need to be 508 uh, compliant. Um, and if you can get that app out there and get real users testing it to figure out the other usability issues before it goes into a full release that does have to be compliant, you're going to have a way better app. Um, I actually believe that 5-way compliance is great for apps. I mean, it's, I think it's wonderful that you know, the government insists on that. You're right. It would be something that would be nice to add on a little bit l later. But um, what kills us now is, have, is not having any user testing or any ability to roll it out until everything is done. And um, I think we've, gotten, we've come a really, really long way in government in being able to just call something an alpha or a beta and get users on it before it's hitting that point where it's checking all the boxes. 
Does that help answer your question? Cool. We have a question from Tracy, who works at Twitter over here. Such intros. It's crazy. Um, so, your, uh, the Twitter plug yes, yes, I know. If anyone needs help signing up for an account, please. 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 Yes, yes. Um, so actually, I, I um, just last month being on the IRS website and How hitting fun. a point where between me and my husband sitting here, I was like, we just need to redesign this. We were having our own moment. So um, thank you for the organization. I think they're, it's, it's they're, wonderful. They're doing that. There's, they? a, there's a design oh, challenge yeah. to redesign the uh, 1040 EZ or something like that. There's this great program to great. redesign That's it. Any, anyone can go, go redesign your form and send it in. Yes, I got stuck in a very painful login loop. Um, so it was, it was awful. But um, one of the questions, actually, that I have is how you structure. So obviously, it sounds like you've developed a great approach for how to come in and kind of reshape um, a team's thinking about um, creating a product and where to start. But as we all know, products need maintenance. You need yeah. to upgrade. You need to constantly be giving them the care and feeding um, to keep them um, successfully working. So how do you do that kind of after a fellowship is ended to make sure that the, um, the technology expertise and kind of the, mm -hmm. the approach doesn't leave with it and you make sure that they're supported going forward and for the next thing they try to put together? And I think this is the last question, by the way. And, yeah, and it's the question that we could talk all day about. So um, it's, a, it's a fantastic question. It's the question that every Code for America fellow stresses out about from day one. Um, it's the question we stress out about most. Um, and in fact, I, I think you're um, sort of calling out that it's the sustainability of the approach moving forward and the sustainability of the app um, that you're trying to balance. Jessica and I were just talking about this. Um, uh, her, her city partners in Kansas City are really interested in everything they can get out of their Code for America fellows team. They will help them um, sustain the approach. Um, and that sometimes that involves training, it involves um, uh, you know, going and looking at apps that you weren't there brought in to look at or problems that you weren't brought there to solve. Um, on the sustain and, and in, in fact, I would say, um, as much as I'm really, really proud of a lot of the apps that have come out of, of Code for America and the impact they've had, um, the things that government partners have said to us about the sustain, uh, you know, under the banner of sustainability of the approach, have been like, you know, will uh, make me incredibly proud. Um, the, uh, the second year, we worked with a woman in Detroit who said, "I've been a public servant for 35 years, and I stopped believing I could serve the public." I now believe I can do that again. You have made me proud to be a part. It was just, we've had such great feedback about how enabling this is for people who have really, really, really hard jobs. And they, to a person, um, want to do a good job at them. So that part is so important. And we do struggle with, if you have a team, just focus on the app for the whole year and not do that other handhold hand holding is the wrong word, but empowerment work. Um, you 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 could just have sort of a different balance. Um, the the short answer about uh, how these things are sustained is that uh, they've either gone into startups and spun out, and we've had uh, seven or eight of those so far. Um, some of which have been acquired now, some of which are still going concerns. Um, in many cases, this this uh, the those two things of training and the app sort of went together, and the local government was able to sustain it and continue it. Um, that means we've trained um, IT departments in things like Ruby on Rails quite a bit. Um, we've trained them in sort of DevOps um, functionality that they didn't have before. Um, and in some cases, they haven't survived. So. Um, there's a, there's a wide range. And then, and then the third thing is that there are now a smaller set of apps that we are trying to take very intentionally you know, from jurisdiction to jurisdiction that we maintain. But at the scale that we've been doing them, we haven't been able to maintain them all. Well, thank you very much. I think some of what you said today about user-centric design and making things more effective, uh, ways to reduce risk by iteration, getting in front of users, getting real feedback, those, I think, are even more important than the pure like technology skills or DevOps tips that you give someone. And uh, that's what I hope you keep advocating for, because I think it has a really big impact. So I want to thank you myself. Thing. And, and uh, please join me in thanking Jen. Thanks. Thanks, Mark.